be listening. But... <laughs> <laughs> we'll do our best, Doggy. Uh, well, we are live, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to the final session of uh, today's Whiskey Festival in a Box, uh, Saturday the 17th of October, are we? I've kind of lost count now. Um, delighted to say that we're here to do the Indie Bottlers uh, session, and we've actually got all of our presenters here, which is a bit of a miracle. Um, you can see them all on the screen there in the gloriousness. Um, I'm going to send most of them away as we talk to each one one by one, um, but you'll see them all again a little bit later. So say hi, bye. Hi, bye. Hi, bye. Hi, bye. <laughs> uh, who am I keeping? I'm keeping. It's like a lucky dip. <laughs> I was. We'll settle for Mr. Chilton, I think. How are you doing, oh, mate? Oh, thank you. I'm all right. I'm surviving. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. Yeah, I felt more comfortable with lots of other people on the screen to look at. I don't like just staring at you, to be honest with you. It's a bit weird. Why? What's wrong with me? You've got a distillery to look at as well. That's true. That's true. Nice distraction. And you're a bit you're a bit far away. Am I? Or you get very small. I'm not sure. I, I'm socially distanced from you. Okay. Or the camera. <laughs> Um, so what 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 you been up to? How's how's the family? Family is good, Eddie. They are mostly behaving themselves as much as a four year old ever does, and a pregnant wife ever does. Um, yeah, no, we're all good. I was actually going to be in York in two weeks' time, but obviously not doing that now. So instead, I'm going to go to. Uh, I know. Where we're, are you? But you're not. You're not in London, so you're not under the same uh, level two as as us in London, are you? No, I live, uh, I live far away from people, so don't. <laughs> <laughs> Probably for the best, um, for, for all of us. But anyway, Ollie, yeah. I'm, um, I'm, thank you so much for coming on. It's, uh, I know you've, done, you've already done quite a lot of tastings for us this year, and it's always appreciated, even if I may not ever show it. Um, so uh, thanks for coming on, and... Um, I'm going to let you fly solo just for a few minutes because I know you don't really like doing that, and uh, we'll have we'll have some banter later, I promise. But obviously, there are people who who have got these packs and would like to know about the whiskey and what you do. Um, so if you can just do a little bit of that, and then we can have some back and forth in a little while. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Great, thanks, man. All right, so uh, for those who don't know me, my name's Oliver Chilton. I work for Elixir Distillers. We're um, an independent bottler, hence the reason we're in this pack. Um, I, we buy casks of whiskey and put them in bottle. You probably already know all that, so I'll let someone go into more detail later on rather than wasting my time now. Um, Elixir Distillers is uh, it's owned by a guy called Sukinder Singh, um, who owns a small online shop um, you may have heard of. Uh, though our bottles are sold everywhere, including on the lovely um, House of Malt. Um, and Elix Distillers has a kind of conceptual idea as a, as a part of Sikinda's hobby, started in 2002, at least 2000, early 2000s when he bottled the first cask of whiskey. And the whiskey I'm going to show you today is from our Single Mots of Scotland series, which uh, the first label came out in 2002. Um, it's gone through lots of changes over that time. so. Originally, it was just buying a cask of whiskey, buying a cask of whiskey, much like every other small independent bottler. Um, during the kind of mid-2000s, we did like little batches of whiskey, so two, three casks at a time. Um, and then in 2013, when I, I moved over to this side of the business, I used to work in the shops, um, into you know, buying casks and putting them in bottles, I was far too nervous to blend anything together, so we, we went back to single casks. Um, however, as time has gone on, and as I've been buying casks now for uh, probably not even half as long as most of the people on this chat, um, a few years, we've kind of gained in confidence as a business and we started looking more at putting stuff together. So the first whiskey we're trying is a, is a Glen Elgin 2007. It's part of our reserve casks uh, range, which is kind of our entry level. It's where we, where we kind of convert you from buying standard single malt whiskey uh, to independently bottle single malt whiskey. Um, I'm always chuffed to be part of these kind of panel things because for me, independent bottling, you, you can't live on your own. Um, my background was all uh, in retail, so 
flogging bottles to people. And, it, and it's always a struggle to explain the concept of they don't own a distillery, they buy casks and they put it in a bottle and, and they put their approval on it or, or however you want to present it. And it's always difficult if you're just explaining one company. I always like to see it as a family. Um, we're doing very similar jobs, doing similar things, and essentially buying from the same places. Um, this particular bottle that we've got is a parcel of four casks, four hogsheads, uh, all distilled at Glen Elgin in 2007. We actually bought a uh, much bigger parcel, so we'll buy kind of 10, 20, 30 casks at a time from the distillery in a vintage, and then we'll work our way, um, drink our way through all of those samples to find the ones that either stand out on their own or work better together or need more time. Um, so reserve casks is where we put up in a parcels where you definitely find some casks need a bit of help um, sometimes from the cask next door. Um, we reduce them to 48%. We do it 48% very simply because I like drinking at 48%. Uh, it's the alcohol's low enough that you can you can chug it. That's probably not responsible drinking, is it? That you can sip it. Uh, nicely without uh, thinking, well, that's hot. Um, and it maintains enough alcohol that it still be run your filtered. You don't have to add colouring. For those that have got the pack and are watching this, you'll notice the colour of the whiskey um, is quite light. Uh, it's all from refill American oak. Uh, quite careful with the term. So they were probably at one point bourbon barrels that were then broken down, the stage broken down and turned into a 250 litre cask or the hogshead. Uh, they will have contained whiskey several times before. Most of the time when, when I go look at these casks there, before filling they're 10, anywhere between 10 and 20 years of age. So, you know, the, the word's pretty well used. Um, there are positives, negative stuff. Negative, obviously, you don't get all the vanilla, you don't get all the sweet and stuff that uh, for some makes works really well. Um, but the positive is that you can really taste the make. So if you've got a really good quality make, um, that has really lovely characters, uh, which I, I believe Glen Elgin is, you can really kind of taste uh, what people who made the spirit were doing. Um, Glen Elgin, I should tell you a little bit about the actual whiskey. Glen Elgin um, is a very old established distillery, mainly used in blends, historically used in blends, historically used in White Horse. Um, and it's owned by the biggest distiller of Ramul Diageo. They make a, an interesting kind of juxtaposition of a spirit. Cause it's, to me, it's always quite apple, it's quite light in, in some respects. But it's also got a certain weight to it. Um, they've got um, uh, worm tough condensers on, which tend to result in heavier spirits. Um, but it's not kind of your kind of sulfuric heavy, more wacky style. It's more of it's, it's more elegant than that. Um, and that's why for me, you can bottle it relatively young. So this was bottled start of the year, so I think it's 13 years of age. Um, and I think it really shines in the glass. For me, um, I hate doing old tasting it things at the end of the day, it's what you try. But for me, I do get kind of apples, I get that kind of baked apples, baked apple tart, um, which it, hopefully I find very Moorish. Um, I said 48% means that we can drink it quite easily, I hope. Um, and it also, as I said earlier, it may, means that we don't have to chill filter it. So if you add any water to this, it will go cloudy. Um, that is just the fats, uh, basically. Lots of compounds coming together uh, that activate and make it go hazy. Um, but as everybody knows, everybody likes to cook, and everyone look at me now can tell fats are good. Um, you want fats. They create texture, they create body. So we, and I think everybody in the lineup today, um, does not chill filter. I believe Mark has quite strong views on it that I'm sure he'll share. Did I talk fast enough? Did I get through that 10 minutes, I think. He did very well, Ollie. Well done. Well done. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely uh, kind of breakfast dram. I think the, uh, this, this Glen Elgin is really light and perfumey and soft and supple. Um, what I was going to ask you as an independent bottler, as, as pr pretty much what you're doing full time now, obviously that wasn't always the case, but that's what you do and have done for quite a bit. What's the favorite part of your, your job? Or what's the most rewarding part of your job? It's really funny, isn't it? Because I actually really enjoy the spreadsheets, but I'm probably not supposed to say that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed to say, the drinking the car samples, it's really not. I mean, I, I have to build up to that some weeks. 
because quite often what you're drinking is utter, utterly shy. Um, <laughs> I think the most enjoyable things to people, like obviously it's great when we're getting out to meet customers and all, all that's great fun because essentially I'm speaking to people like myself. There's something quite nice in that. Um, but actually what I really like is the other people in the industry. So pretty much everyone on the chat today, well, everybody on the chat today, I've had many drums and beers with. Um, and that's the kind of whiskey industry thing. You, you get to know everyone, but I kind of feel like independent bottling, you're a subset. So, you, you know, some distillers look down on you from on high, like some yeah. kind of uh, So you end up kind of grouping together. So, you know, I've, I've been in compromising positions with everybody in this chat at one point or another. Uh, so I would say that that's pretty much my, my favorite thing about it. Um, outside of that, I think the, the best thing about independent bottling overall is the range of stuff you know having your own distillery I'm, I'm very jealous of those people who have their own distillery and get to make spirit that that would be fantastic mm. however there's something lovely about working with everybody else's um you get to sit to one side and you get to be quite critical which i am um sometimes probably too critical um you know you get to be a, an, an armchair you know warrior on on whiskey but you also get to spend money on it in kind of big big ways um when you find stuff that's really good you can research why it's really good and you can use that i, I love the fact that i can use my hobby as a as a way to buy whiskey uh, but in a much bigger scale and put it into bottles so as an example when we find a particular vintage of a particular mate um I'll then sometimes go back and I'll go and speak to the people at the distillery and try and find out why it was nice. And, and then I turn that into a reason to buy more whiskey. Um, so, yeah, I guess those are the kind of the elements. I love the, the, the choice. Um, I also just love the people you get to work with. Yeah, yeah, cool. What about um, the worst thing about your job, apart from being on this? Uh, <laughs> this isn't so bad, Eddie. It's just whiskey land. Whiskey land is all right. <laughs> I'll give you the five for later for saying it. Um, <laughs> I still know it's been a really difficult week, so I can't answer it honestly. Um, there's there there are elements like as the as our company's grown, we're dealing with more and more people. And I'll be honest, when you're on your own, uh, like Mark and Kate are, there's a certain joy in that. Um, you've only got yourself to blame when stuff goes wrong. So that's that's definitely an interesting one. But in terms of the actual independent bottling. It's challenging, like certainly three, four, five years ago, it was challenging when we couldn't find whiskey. So, you know, when I started, when I started in shops, um, like back in 2004, five, that kind of time, there was so much whiskey, like, and it was ridiculous. Uh, you look back at what we were buying from uh, Douglas Lang and Berries and um, Signature and Duncan Palin, you look at the whiskies they were bottling, it was absolutely insane. Um, now we're kind of not, we're not there again, but we're certainly at a point where there's a lot more liquid. You know, you can, you can buy a lot of liquid at the moment, you can find mm -hmm. stuff, and if you're willing to sell in a while, you can, you can find some pretty special stuff. But about four or five years ago, I think that was when it was really hard to find really good quality liquid and a lot of it you, know, mm -hmm. you find one cask here one cask there um and that can be a bit tiring that can be a bit uh, yeah can feel really inaccurate if you're trying trying a hundred things that you know costing a fortune and they're all rubbish yeah i imagine that could be quite demoralizing um as well as inebriating actually but if you're not careful you, um, can't, look, you can't complain no, <laughs> all the job no, involved no, is definitely, no. definitely probably the best one Yes, I think I think you're probably right in that regard. Okay, listen, Ollie, that's been really good, fascinating as always, um, and a great opener for for ten. Uh, I'm going to pop you back in the waiting room if you don't mind, and bring you no, back later on. Talk in the, the waiting room. room. I meant to ask that. In there, Sorry, do we get to you talk? Can, in you, the can, room? you can message each other, and you oh, know, yeah. be as rude as you like on the private chat, but you can't. I don't think you can actually chat to each other. I know it's a bit annoying, but um, that's. That's the way the cookie crumbles, I'm afraid. So I will see you. I'll see you in a little while, mate. All right. Thank you. Me. Thank you, Ollie. Okay, I'm going to bring in now a, um, a. Well, these are these are all some of my favourite people, to be honest, and and that goes for everyone this weekend. But um, I'm going to bring on a, a real character in the industry, um, 
that sh should maybe come with a slight kind of health advice label on his shirt or something because this man is uh, is capable of, of, of all manner of uh, getting you in awful states. Um, so I'm going to bring in uh, Mark Watt. I hope, I hope you take that as a complete compliment as it was meant to be. Um, in, in fairness, actually, I do. It's... <laughs> <laughs> Although, I don't know. I think a lot of the time it's the blind leading the blind, particularly, again, with everyone that's in this chat. You know, I might get the blame, but, you know, you can bring a horse to water. But uh... Yeah, okay, I know. I know I, I'm, I'm, I'm a fine one to talk is basically what you're trying to say. <laughs> it's all good. Well, listen, Mark, I mean, of, of, of all of the presenters um, this evening, um, you know, your, your whiskey, your bottles are the most fresh off the line, as it were, you know, and you've really uh, put yourself, you know, your, your, your livelihood, everything, on, you have know, staked everything on this new business. And I think it's really worth, um, you know, delving into that because, you, you know, you, later on, because I think it's very important that people realize that, yeah, it's not whiskey. Isn't all about big big business. It's about people and relationships, and and uh, you know, uh, selling through those relationships. So, I think you know of, of everyone here, you know, much admiration for what you're what you're doing, and um, we all hope the best for you. But and anyway, I'm digressing slightly. Um, I'd like you to obviously introduce yourself. Um, what 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 whiskey is about. <laughs> And uh, and then and then we can have a little uh, yeah just tell them about the um, the manic moor as well and, and then we can have a little bit of a, a tate tate. Okay, so on you go, big fella. So yeah, so I'm for those of you who don't know, I'm Mark Watt. Uh, myself and my wife Kate, we recently founded Watt Whiskey. We are Scotland's fastest growing whiskey company, and that we went from zero bottles to selling 10 bottles this week. But uh, yeah, we've just set up our own independent bottling company, so it's really a privilege for, for me to be included in this tasting with such great companies and great people. Um, we've just launched our first five casks. Um, we've been wanting to, be, to have our own company for a long time, potentially, but never really thought about it. And then things came together and we thought, Let, let's give it a try. And so we have done, and we've been very lucky that we, I mean, between myself and Kate, we've had 40 years experience in the industry. Uh, I've had 39 of them, Kate's had one, no, I'm only joking. Um, and we've been very lucky to work with our contacts quite a lot to get things happening. Uh, I've previously worked for Caddenheads, obviously, and at Duncan Taylor, so always worked with people who had their own bottling hole. Um, so basically, I'm just doing the same job as I've always done, but now with uh, with our, our own money, which makes it much more difficult. Although obviously we had the crowdfunder, which helped helped a lot, and that was fantastic. Uh, the support that we've had has been amazing, which has allowed us to start with five casks. And one of the casks that we started on was this uh, Manic Moor. Um, you'll see there the taste bud, and also from our t-shirt company that we've set up. Uh, we are very much focused on being all about the taste, um, so everything we do is all all about the taste and things that we like. Um, so we've done a lot of things that I probably wouldn't have wanted to do when I first started off, like having boxes and things. I wanted to be, right, we'll have a bottle, and we'll maybe put a label on it, and that'll be it. Um, but obviously, we, we, we've we had to fold to commercial reasons or whatever, but it, it, it does look good. Um, so the logo is is a taste bud because we're we're all about the taste. Um, and this Manic Moor is one of the first five casks we did, and we bought this cask by accident, um, which is not one hundred percent true, but is true. When we got the samples, we've been very lucky again, having good um, good connections in the whiskey industry. You know, we've bought casks from six different sources so far, which is not bad, I think. Um, we got a list and there was a Manic Moor 2000 and whatever year it is, 2008 on the list and I thought, oh, I'll get a sample of that. I quite fancy that. And fairness, Kate was like, Manic Moor? Mm. Uh, again, this is like um, like Ollie's Glen Elgin. Not the greatest of names. You know, there's no Glen Elgin collectors. There's, I was going to say there's no Manic Moor collectors, but there is one. Ulf, if you're watching, nice to see you. 
Um, but I, I always quite like Manic Moore, and I know Manic Moore from around 2008 is quite good. Got the sample, tried it. Thought, lovely, lovely mouthfeel. Nice, rich and creamy. And then we ordered the cask, and then we're told, oh, see that hogshead that you ordered? It's not a hogshead. It's two hogsheads that have been married together and put into a brandy butt. Um, so there was actually 600 and... 63 bottles in the cask. Now, had I seen on the list that it had been finished in a brandy butt um, for three months, I wouldn't have asked for a sample. I would have been like, nah, you're all right, move it on. Uh, generally speaking, I'm all about like finishes are, you know, a year and a half, two years, allow things to get integrated. But we love this whiskey and we, I wouldn't say we took a punt on it, but we loved it and we thought, what will we do? Will we buy it? Will we buy half of it? And we went for the mental option of starting a new company with a manic 663 bottles of manic more. Now, probably I don't think anyone's ever sold 663 bottles of manic more before. Um, but again, it comes down to what we're all about. It's it's the taste, the the quality, the mouthfeel. Um, did the brandy butt add to it? I think it did, but I don't know because I'd never tried it before it went into the brandy butt. But I do think it's probably given it a bit more richness and a bit more mouthfeel coming through in in the whiskey, and that's that's what we're all about. And we we it's been strange. I've always worked for companies where I've been allowed to say what I want, to be honest, um, or more or less. Um, so now we really can be honest. Um, not that I wasn't before, as you all know. Uh, but we want to be as transparent as possible, so we tell people what it is. It would be easy enough for us to say this is just a brandy cask finish and not tell people, but we tell people the complete full details. Uh, if we can tell people, we'll be transparent as possible. Sometimes we can't. You know, we bought a cask of, I very nearly said the distillery name, um, that we weren't allowed to bottle, weren't allowed to put on in the bottle, But so we bottled that as a, as a Highland or whatever. But when we can um, tell you what it is, we will. So this whiskey has probably changed my views that I will now um, look into things that have had shorter finishes, perhaps. Um, but finishes are not what we're all about. It was just that we happen to really love this one. And I think hopefully those of you who are tasting along will enjoy it as well. Uh, not as good as Haig, though. Well, one of the best adverts about Haig is don't, you know, don't be vague as for Haig. I can't think of a rhyme for Manic more, but just give me some more. Um, but it's it's one of these things I, I, I really like. And we're looking forward to doing more and more casks. Uh, we've started with five. The hope is we do uh, four releases a year of five or six casks. You know, we're not looking to take over the world. Um, we're just wanting to bought some good whiskey, make enough money to pay the mortgage. Um, and and that you know and have some fun while doing it and you know we've been lucky a lot of people have said this oh starting a new independent bowling is, is very difficult it's very hard and yeah it, it is um but the hardest thing we found is working with couriers um you know but again people forget that we've had you know 20 years in the industry i've been i've been doing this for a long time uh so it's it's nice and the the whole thing about what whiskey we Cheers, Julie. We, okay, everyone knows me, I've got a massive ego, and well, let's just put my name on it. We didn't want to do that. We we came up with the idea of calling the company the Camelton Whiskey Company Limited because the name was available, and it's too good a name not to have. And then looking into the labeling issues, if you have the name of a region on your label, you can't then use any other whiskey from any other region. So therefore, our design team, our London design team, did you ever think I would say that? Um, came up with the idea of pushing the Watt brand and Watt whiskey, and obviously we've got Watt rum, and then in the future, who knows? But the philosophy, like everyone that's on here tonight, non-chill filtered, natural color, you know, we're being honest, we, we don't have oodles of money, we'll, we're doing all right, um, but, We've got, we own, I was going to say we own 15 casks. We don't, we own 10 because we bottled five of them. Um, we don't have huge amounts of casks that we can do, but we're looking to lay down 
in the future, but at the minute we're buying and bottling. So that, that's pretty much us in a nutshell. Um, keep it small, keep it happy, and just drink good whiskey. Yeah. Well, that's what it's all about, isn't it? <laughs> I was going to just quickly ask you um, the name of the distillery that you couldn't name. I, I, I couldn't possibly name it. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. I thought I could get round you there. It it's is. Clearly, it's clearly a bit early. But... <laughs> um, well, as as you alluded to and have said, and I mentioned earlier on, you know, it's a very young business. I think you only took um, delivery of the first yeah. bottles a fortnight ago, or even less. Um, but the amount of the amount of pride and satisfaction you must have felt when you finally got delivery of those bottles and seeing your name on them. And yeah, I mean, it was really huge. It it was a strange experience for us because, well, for me because I've been buying and selling and bottling and selecting casks for, for a long time. So doing it for herself, it didn't really feel that special because it's just something I've always done. And it wasn't until we got the bottle in our hand, you know, and then the other week I was in the Highland Run in Craigelke and I had a dram of my own whiskey in the pub I learned to drink in. And you're like, mm -hmm. wow. You know, um, and there's lots of people, you know, that we need to thank for that coming to fruition, you know, and... Uh, I think that's where we've been lucky. We've managed to pull on, pull on years of drinks tokens of our people. <laughs> yeah. um, well, that's, that's, that's what friends are for, Mark. And you know, yeah. I think, I think what's it's it's very much as Ollie said earlier on. You know, there's 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 the Scotch whiskey or you know, whiskey as a whole, uh, but then independent bottlers. And I think that. Um, you know, the amount of goodwill, particularly in the in the. Um... But I think, I think there's there's room for 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 every and you know, if if we were at a physical festival just now and I would have people come up to my stand and ask stuff, I'd probably send them to the Cadenade stand. I'd send them to the single cast nation stand. You know, I'd send them to. Oh, I'm not going to mention them all, but you know, send all these stands. Oh, you need to go and try that. You need to go and try that. And I yeah. think yeah. that's the the thing that I love most about this industry is that the. the camaraderie you know if if we could if we were all physical just now we'd finish this off and we'd go for a pint together um, and technically we're all competition but no one just drinks hot whiskey no one just drinks cat and heads no one just drinks you know berry brothers and Rudd. everyone at our level of drinking they're promiscuous you know you drink lots of different things and then you come back to something else and then you drink something else it's it's and that, that's what I love about it. You know, that Glen Elgin, I love Glen Elgin. I'm looking forward to trying through the rest of them tonight. Um, and that's probably the thing I miss most at, about lockdown is not being able to just do the fact with people. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, this is, this is, this is, this is the uh, second best, but it's, it's what yeah. it's all, I mean, it's all we've, we've got. I, I would never say your second best. <laughs> I didn't mean me personally, <laughs> but yeah, you could say that too. <laughs> so me yeah. in online form is third or fourth best. Is that what you're saying? Great. Okay. Listen, Mark, um, um, that was, that was brilliant. And thanks for uh, the manic more is, is, it's a stunner. And I, you know, for, for me, it's not something that you walk into a bar and go, Ooh, the manic I must have it. And that's why it's great to let people try it in these tasting packs. Because yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, okay. it's like you said. I think it wasn't in this presentation, but you said in. Um, I think it was during the whiskey show um, tasting you did with Ollie and uh, Cara Lang, and you said that the only Manach more that most people would have known about was the Loch Dew. Yeah, which, uh, which, which, as you said, was probably one of the worst whiskies ever produced. Um, but yeah, so this this just shows you that uh, you can't write off a distillery just because of one really bad bottling. Um, but anyway, we're, we're gonna we're gonna move on because we want to get you, we want to. I, I want to try these next whiskies. So exactly, exactly. So let's shut up and uh, I'll bring I'll bring Jess in and I'll get you back on a bit later, buddy. Okay. Cool. Cheers, man. Jess. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Good to see you. How are you? I'm good. I'm enjoying your um, 
empty chair next to you. It feels like I could just kind of hop across the screen and sit down. Well, and my well, uh, you would be you know, free to do so, but you're not exactly next door, are you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, the Spirit of Yorkshire very kindly, obviously, given us this space to use for the entirety of the festival. Um, but they normally use this space for tasting, you know, for on Zoom tastings and things where they have more than one of them presenting. So the, the chair is uh, not for each of my buttocks. It's just for uh, special guests. <laughs> right. I feel um, like you know it, it's um, a kind of, you know, you're obviously in God's own county. So one York person to another. I'm touched by the gesture. Oh, well, more than welcome. More than welcome. Now I'm just going to pour some of your clean leash um but anyway whilst i do that jess i don't want to use up your time um too much um i want you to tell everyone because single cast nation is obviously not a bottler that many people will have come across um and i think it deserves to be talked about so why don't you talk about it and then we'll we'll have another chat in a bit okay cool um well to those of you who don't know um i am the we recently decided global representative of Single Cask Nation. Um, there are just three of us in the company um, and we uh, were all Jays. So um, my two bosses, hello if you're watching, Joshua and Jason over in the US. Um, and I am the most recent J. Um, I am Jess and I guess uh, that's it. We can close the books now. That's um, all the Js we need. So um, if you were going to apply to Single Cast Nation, sorry, can't help you. Um, but to those of you who maybe don't know us, um, Single Cast Nation are an independent bottler. Uh, we have been going for just shy of 10 years now. Um, but maybe the reason most people don't know us is because we have been based in the US until last year. So um, we started in 2011 with an online members um, society, the idea being that it was um, a group of like-minded people who wanted to get together and um, drink delicious whiskies. I like to think we did it quite well. Um, and then we launched a retail <clears throat> arm in 2017. So um, we started making our bottlings available in select retail stores across the US. And then uh, I came on board just, just over a year ago, we started. Um, we had our first release, we actually launched at Glasgow's Whiskey Festival. And um, if you remember the olden days when we could go to festivals and um, shout across tables at each other um, and drink lots of delicious drams. Um, so that's, uh, it really feels like a world away. Um, so we did six uh, bottles in our first release. We had four single malts, a blended malt and a rum, uh, which is probably one of my favorites from that release, um, a 16 year old Trinidadian rum, which was delicious. Uh, and so uh, we had started to plan our second release and then uh, a little pandemic happened. So we are a little bit behind where I was hoping to be for uh, 2020. Um, but what I'm really excited to bring to the Whiskey Lounge and to our festival in a box is a bottle from our new release. In fact, it is so new that I don't even have an official label that I can show you. Um, even my bottle under the computer here is a, a bottling line production label. So um, it will be in keeping with the cask that's behind me. And you can see just behind over my shoulder here um, bottles from our first release. So um, you kind of, you, you sort of know what we're looking for here. Um, but never mind the labels, and um, we can talk about packaging all day. What's in the bottle, as you've already heard uh, Mark and Ollie say, is the most important bit. So um, I have pre poured my Klein Leash. I hope that if you are drinking along with us, you have also now poured yourself the Klein Leash. Um, this is a uh, 2011, it's, it's a nine year old. Um, it's quite a big punchy dram. So uh, on the nose, I think this is, it's quite typical for me of young Klein Leash. It's not particularly big and farmy and waxy like some of the <clears throat> older Klein Leashes tend to be. To me, this is full of like fruits and um, like a really nice kind of touch of custard. I can see Ollie has said down here, custard cream. Yeah, good, good. Um, to me, this is, um, a really great example of allowing a whiskey to shine through. So this is from our refill bourbon, which Ollie was talking about earlier, allows you to have um, more of the spirit, I guess, shining through. Um, 
uh, on the palette. I think this is great. It's got lots of kind of oaky juiciness. Um, and I think it's got a slight, an almost spicy feel, like as if you sort of, um, like you've got jalapenos on nachos. It could be because we're getting to that time of day where I'm getting a bit peckish, but um, that's what I've got. Um, and I think it's got a really decent feel. Um, we talk a lot at Single Cast Nation about being all about mouthfeel um, and texture. We're texture guys, which I feel like I'm, in, I'm sort of in uh, okay company here because you guys, if I say we're all about texture, we, we kind of understand what we're talking about here. So we want something that's big and mouth filling. You don't want it to disappear off the palate too quickly. Um, and I think it's got a pretty good lingering fruitiness to it. Um, and I, I think what I really love about this clean leash is it's a, a great circular dram. So we come back to where we started from. So we go back to that um, lovely fruitiness and more of those kind of like, um, like sort of, <laughs> this is a weird taste note, like candy necklace sweets. Do you not think it's got that kind of um, like fruit salad, chewy type stuff? So maybe not quite what I would expect from um, a big dirty Klein leash, but um, I think it's got a lovely sort of fruitiness to it. I could drink this for a long time. Yes, I, I totally agree. Oh, I hope you don't mind me stepping in there because I, want, I, want, I wanted to agree with you and it sounded like you needed someone to talk to, even if it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's, it's absolutely delicious. And do you know what? Um, I, I, I don't think it needs water. I think it, it's just so yummy, you know, really in, that's that intensity. There's a real kind of almost drying spiciness about yeah. it, which I think you'd lose with the, with the drop of water even. Um, so I, I'm going for, for as it comes on this one. I don't know how you feel about that. Um, the first kind of, the first couple of times I tried it when we were, when I got hold of the samples, um, I added like a tiny splash of water just to dial back some of that pepperiness. But actually I find that the more I'm kind of getting into it, um, I don't. I don't think I need to add water. And um, typically, I tend to not add too much water into my drums anyway, which sometimes gets me into trouble, especially for my <laughs> But um, yeah, I think a lot of our um, bottles we try to bottle um, whiskies that we think you can drink naturally, and then if you want to add water or whatever you fancy adulterating your whiskey in, we're not snobs here. Um, you know, you can do that too, but it allows you to experience it you know, naturally, that's what we're looking for too. So like a lot of indie bottlers, we're all about keeping the, we're letting the whiskey do the talking and like letting me witter on here, but you know, keeping the, the whiskey in the conversation whilst you're drinking it. Um, Sue Brody asks quite uh, legitimately, can you confirm the ABV on it, please? Uh, yep, the ABV is 60.1. I should maybe have pointed that out. Sometimes I, let people try the drams and then I tell them the ABV because if no, we no, you no. first, it can kind of um, change your opinion a bit. Yeah, no, it's not your fault. I think it's my fault on the printing on the uh, on the insert for the pack. So sorry about that. No, but that's okay. Um, it could also be because we had in our US release last year, we had um, a nine-year-old Klein leash as well. Uh, so okay. I am. Yeah. I am a massive fan of Klein Leash. Um, and we had the US release had two Klein Leashes as a kind of head to head. We had a nine and a 23. Uh, um, and I said, I wanted a Klein Leash to have selfishly for me in the UK and the rest of the world. So um, that's mm -hmm. that's kind of how we've come to this. Yeah. But I mean, that that's just one of those whiskeys, you know, where you taste it at full strength. And you know, I had to look at the bottle myself actually to see the strength on it. and. 60.1 it just does not taste like 60.1 does it i mean it's just that is probably one of the most dangerous whiskies i've ever tasted that's good that's, that's, a, that's the kind of feedback i want i'm going to put these sort of comments on the next batch of labels you know like dangerous <laughs> yeah I think, you know, no i think i think you know you could you could quite comfortably have a session on that yeah um although probably about the day after it could be slightly well, more dicey if, if there was a day after, to be honest, I'm not sure there would be. <laughs> um, <laughs> incredible stuff. And um, Jess, you, obviously you're you're um, you're relatively new to the, the the global ambassador role now. Congratulations, by the way. Hi. Um, how how are you finding it? Because obviously you're not able to do the travelling that I'm sure you were looking forward to doing. Um, how are you finding things? It's good. I was um, talking to a friend 
uh, just yesterday, we were saying this weekend would have been like the um, whiskey based gathering in Rotterdam. Mm -hmm. And it's funny how quick that's come around. I remember last year, I just missed the boat. And so I was looking forward to going this year. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's yeah, the not traveling is really, really weird. It's quite frustrating, but it's you know, this is a great job to have. I've although I've only been doing um single cast nation for a year, I've been working with whiskey for about 10 years now. So yeah. I've just done a, a stack of different jobs with it, and this is really it's great fun. It's a pretty steep learning curve. It's um it's funny, Ollie talking about being on your own, because obviously my colleagues are in the US, so I don't have kind of we have meetings and stuff across the internet, but it's not the same as having someone in an office to kind of turn around to and talk rubbish over a coffee machine with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I sympathise. I mean, I suppose the only uh, comfort is that we're all in the same boat to a degree. Definitely. Um, none of us is able to go to any, you know, whiskey, f physical whiskey events. Um, so we, 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 we do what we can. We adapt and we evolve and we... And we drink whiskey next to a computer instead. <laughs> it's nice though. I mean, I'm next to a computer, but I feel like I'm in a room with a lot of people drinking. It's nice. It's not a lonely feeling. It's lovely to talk to people online. I have a lot of fun. My life is one endless Zoom session. Um, I, yeah. And it's very nice getting to see people and talk to people that I wouldn't necessarily have been able to talk to um, you know, because they're not in Glasgow. So we're yeah. on really hard lockdown here in Glasgow. We have no pubs um you know like you shouldn't be traveling if you can't it's um it's a really tough time to be in the hospitality industry and i guess we all need to adapt and and change as we can so yeah yeah exactly it, exactly but you're right it's nice to feel like we're all in this for you know togetherness we're, yeah. we're all together yeah exactly exactly we, w we will we will get through it eventually my goodness me, what the party's going to be like when, uh, when we finally do it, Rowan. <laughs> that might well be the death of me. Mm. Uh, and so oh. <laughs> thanks, Jess. Uh, well, listen, thanks. That's, that, that's been great. And that Klein Leash is, is awesome. As I mean, you've seen some of the, the comments coming through. I think it's uh, much beloved. Um, and, yeah, great stuff. Um, you Yes. And I will get you back in um, in a little while, but I'm going to bring in uh, another great bloke. Let me see if I can find him. Um, Cameron. I thought you were looking for a great bloke, Eddie. Yeah. Are we having a candlelit dinner or something? What's going on there? Uh, I'm actually in the, the boardroom of, the, of our shop. Uh, oh, I didn't really like what I'm doing. I thought I would maybe do something a bit special because... Um, my house is basically a tip just now, so uh, I decided to, to go. But the lighting in here is not the best, so yeah. unfortunately, no romance is going on here. So you didn't just break in then? No, no, no. I, I, I did actually make sure that uh, somebody knows that I'm here. <laughs> is that are you growing a moustache or something? I, I, I painted. It, I've been trying for months now, Eddie. <laughs> it's not happening. Oh dear. Anyway, listen, Cameron, it's great to see you. I, we, we've messaged a little bit back and forth over the last few months, um, but it's good to see you, well, as in person as we're going to get. Thank you, too. And um, thank you for, for sending the, um, the, the whiskey you have. Uh, very much looking forward to trying it. I've actually resisted trying, uh, trying uh, this one, um, but I'm going to pour myself a wee one now while you tell us all about cabin heads and, uh, and then this bottling. Thanks very much, Eddie. Um, hi there. Uh, my name's Cameron. I'm the sales manager for Cadenheads, which is Scotland's oldest independent bottler. Um, we're owned by a gentleman called Headley Wright, who is also the chairman of Springbank and Glengyle Distilleries, where the uh, Kilcarran whisky is produced. And we're based in the west coast of Scotland in Campbelltown, which was the former Victorian whisky capital of the world. Um, Cadden Heads, um, as I said, we've been bottling whiskey since 1842. And part of our ethos is always to be trying to use quality over quantity. Now, as you've been hearing from other guys too, um, independent bottling, um, we are sourcing casks from all around Scotland, not just Scotland, but around the world too. And we try and just give our own interpretation on what a distillery can do. We will buy whiskey from distilleries that you know. 
will also buy distilleries, uh, whiskey from distilleries that you may not have heard of as much. But the whiskey we're going to try um, today is actually from the Glenrothes distillery, which is a very well-known distillery owned by Edrington in Speyside. And it's an 18-year-old Glenrothes um, from our authentic collection range. Now, we do different ranges of whiskey. Um, being an independent bottler is actually slightly ironic as we are dependent. We're actually dependent on distilleries um, producing whiskey and then making it available. Now, we buy like bulks of casks at a time. We're not just going to be like particularly buying a single cask. Sometimes we will, but the majority of the time we're buying maybe parcels of 20, 30, 40, 50 casks. And even, hi Snoops, and even um, like during the lockdown period there, you know, we were, I think we bought about like 200 and 300 casks, you know. Um, so we've got, multiple distilleries casks as well and when we're doing it as ollie said earlier on not every single cask is going to be an absolute stunner you know in fact a lot of the time they're not the best in the world so um <laughs> there's a time where you might be trying 20 30 40 different samples and to be honest with you there might be 20 30 40 disappointments at that time as well but there's also the times where you'll get a range of samples and then you get one that's a really a real cracker. And we enjoyed this one with this particular bottling we've got up here from Glen Rothis. Um, it's one single cask, 18 years old, and it was bottled at 51.7%. There is a slight mistake on um, the on the pamphlet you have. I think it says 48 point something percent there, but it's actually it's 51.7%. Now this, uh, you probably see by the color as well, pretty light. It would have been from a, a reused bourbon cask. Now, for something that's 18 years old, and I, again, um, I sometimes get a bit complacent by saying like 18 years old, because we've got such a um, an array of stock, that can sometimes seem young to like when we're, some of the bottlings we've done in the past. But 18 years old is actually quite an old whiskey. And when you've got something that long, having something that's been in a refill cask rather than a fresh cask can actually be better because what it will do is it will help mellow out over time. It's not just going to push too much of the wood influence into the cask and you're going to get more of the DNA of the distillery as well. Now, being a space side distillery, Glenrothes, they've got, uh, sorry, Glenrothes themselves have got their own bottlings, of course, you know, the range, they're 12. The, the 10, 12, the 18, et cetera. But this one is one single cask. And being an independent bottler, like all the guys here will tell you, there's no hiding place. You know, um, even if we do a range where we've got maybe multiple casks, it's still, the vatting of those casks is very little compared to what maybe a distillery will use, especially a large distillery, where they could maybe use hundreds of casks. You know, um, so if, one or two or three or even 10 aren't so great, it won't matter, you know, because the rest will compensate that and it will help boost and enhance the flavours. But we don't have any hiding place here. So when we're picking a cask, we've got to try and make sure it is of good quality as well. And we believe it is with this Glenrothes. Now, as the guys have mentioned earlier, tasting notes, it, it everyone has their, it's so individual. Everyone has their own palate. It depends what you've been doing today, it depends your mood. But for me, this one, it's got that nice, nice kind of freshness, the, the, the sort of fruitiness. Um, and the palate as well has got that kind of, it's almost the kind of pine nuts too. The, almost the kind of like, it's, it's, it's got a nice sort of vibrancy as well, a kind of zestiness. But if somebody tastes, bananas or somebody tastes kiwi fruits and the other person doesn't there's no right or wrong and sometimes you can get a, a jedi mind trick involved with tasting notes where you might not taste anything and somebody goes you know uh, almonds go, oh yeah i'm tasting almonds now you know so it, please don't feel that it's right or wrong and even at this one it's bald at 51.7 percent 
Now, that is like high to maybe somebody who's maybe not as is not who's not maybe tried as many single cast or cast strength bottlings. Um, but I also feel that it, it's it, it's not too high in alcohol. It's not. It's got a nice balance. Um, maybe somebody might like want to try a drop or two of water, but to me, I think that's actually really good as it is. But never feel pressurized into thinking you shouldn't put water into it. There's there's a lot of sides to to whiskey, where some people feel that putting water into it's that religious, but it can actually help enhance and open the flavors. And it all depends, as I said before, on your palate. And it can change day by day. But for me, at the moment, I feel this is actually this is actually gorgeous. It's actually perfect just now. And as you can tell, it, it's you're going to put that in the market. You know, um, it's not got it's not got the color to it. You know, we 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 don't add any color. You know, there's no chill filtering involved. So this is literally just the cask we bought. We've done nothing to this. You know, this is as natural as you can get. We've purchased this cask many years ago. We've left it in our warehouse. We've tried it, we liked it, we bottled it. Um, we are very fortunate as well being uh, with Cadnades because we do have the ability with the, being sisters companies with two distilleries. We've got a lot of warehousing. We also actually have a lot of access to, to like buying other casks, like as in empty casks too. Because when, when you're buying a lot of these whiskies, some of them aren't so great. So we can then assess it. We try and assess it at a certain age as well. And also it's time dependent. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of other factors in the job too. So we can't just sit around drinking whiskey all day, although it is quite a big part of the job. But, you know, you, you'll try some, if something maybe eight years old, you might take, I've said just, just a distillery, just for instance, um, like Glenrothes, we'll maybe take 10 samples. You'll try a few and go, do you know what? That, that That's fine. Let's leave it. Um, it. We might not bottle it just now, but we can leave it, let it mature. We're happy with the progression involved. But then you might get one where uh, that's just something not right. Um, you can take the risk and leave it for another five, six, seven years. But if it's maybe 10, 12 years old at that point, you know, you you've got to sort of ask yourself, is there going to be, is the cask going to do anything more to it? So that's when we'll take the decision to maybe stick it into a, a sherry cask or a rum cask or even just a fresh bourbon cask, you know, just to try and reinvigorate it, try and give it a new sense of life. Um, and also just sometimes to have a bit of, bit of fun with it. Um, in fact, in the last, I think the last few months, we've re-racked about nearly 200 casks but we've got a vast amount of casks that it's not a huge part of it. You know, this is something that we could have a bit of fun with. And um, as Mark mentioned earlier on, you know, like uh, I've changed a lot of perceptions too, because I always used to think that it has to be in a cask for a certain amount of time. You know, if you're doing a re-racking, like put it into a sherry cask, for instance. But sometimes you'll get some sherry casks or some bourbon or some rum or some port casks that are very active. And maybe after a year or, or 18 months or, or whatever, it, it's actually, it can be very good and you can get a nice balance to it. But ideally, we try and give it maybe a second maturation of you know, up to maybe three plus years. But it, it just depends. And there's such a versatility with whiskey. And there's each time you do it can be so different, the results you get, that that's a lot of the fun in independent bottling as well is that we are going to give a different in interpretation to what you'll get with maybe the standard range. Or in fact, a lot of cases, some of the facilities we have, you won't actually have heard of because the majority of it is going to be used for blending. So we also get to showcase whiskey that doesn't get the same um, the same focus as you'll see. You know, they, they don't have the marketing, they, they, don't, um, they don't get the same limelight as the big boys. But there's a lot of good whiskey out there and it's fun and it means that every time we do a tasting it, 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 it's you know it's something different we're not doing the same whiskies every single time Does that have a time up eddie yeah yeah come on <laughs> that's enough for christ's sake i know <laughs> i tried to put as much in i actually timed myself there i thought right okay 
your your voice is actually very soothing, and I was kind of uh, in fear of uh, dropping off. It's been a long day. I've got, I've got a really sore throat, Eddie. So it's, oh, I've, that is. I've got the husky tones just now. So that's the. No, it was brilliant. Thank you. And the Glen Rothis is uh, oh, just just lovely. It's and, it's crag and fresh whiskey. You know, it's good for a fresh, and it, it's a tough act to follow the the three that I had before. So I know. I know. Um, it, 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 it's um. Well, so it's, def it's definitely stood up to them all, to be honest. I mean, you know, I, yeah, I, I would be worried going after that Klein Leash because that was uh, stunning and also very intense. But I don't know, it, it's, it still works very well. And uh, someone, someone, um, sorry if I can't remember who it was, flashed on the screen that it was, you know, there was cream soda. And now all I can taste is cream yeah. soda. It's that's the old Jedi mind trick. That's the exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but no, that was, that's fabulous stuff. And I think, um, you know what uh, we've sort of touched upon, and you, you're certainly talking about is, and the opportunity with independent bottlers is that, is that quite often you'll actually get to taste more of the distillate character from that particular distillery. You know, you're more likely to, yeah. to take, potentially taste the true kind of flavour of that distillery. I mean, it's not all, <laughs> yeah. it, yeah, but... and it, it's a kind of particular favourite of like my style too. You know, I love a bourbon cask. I love getting that kind of almost that sort of spirit driven type where you're getting what the the, the distillery character originally was what it was actually making in the first place um no don't get me wrong that there, there are there is a place for like having the the wood finishes and having the different sort of wood styles to help enhance maybe a flavor but it is also good to sort of try something which was actually what they made in the first place yeah yeah. That makes sense. If I'm yeah. just, I might just be gibbering on here, but that's no, not at all. Well, we had um, we had Ronnie Cox on earlier on today, and uh, I think he would love that. I might I might send him a little sample of it if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, of course, because I think he'd uh, he'd love to taste it like that. It's just ten pounds for you, Eddie. That's no problem. <laughs> that's cheap for Campbell Tellman. <laughs> I have, to, I have the pandemic going. I'll take anything. That's. <laughs> I have to say, seeing you and and Mark particularly on this taste, and just takes me back to uh, the last time uh, we were all together. I think probably at the last um, Campbelltown Malts Festival. Yeah. In, in 2019, which seems like a lifetime ago now, doesn't it? it man? That's um. And, uh, it, it seems so long ago. Um, even like missing out this time in May. Uh, we were we were abroad and we were on a trip with Cadnades in New Zealand at the time. And me and one of my colleagues who works for Springbank we were saying that we're just looking at the news and it's when it started to escalate. And we started saying, we're talking of lockdown. We might have to cancel the festival. And we're like, nah, that'll never happen. <laughs> and obviously, a yeah. few days later, we're going, no, this is getting quite serious now. So it's. Yeah. it's yeah. It's a it's a different world than what it was back then. It's oh, it is, it is. But uh, one of my most fond memories of last year. I don't want to talk about the pandemic. I'm sick of it, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But one of my my most fond memories is of you uh, essentially sacking Mark Watt from the bar for for swearing. <laughs> it, was, it was actually more you because you were the bad influence. <laughs> and the it, bar was so small. The bar was so small, and Mark's quite a tall guy. Yeah. And even though I'm. I, I, quite quite tall myself. Um, I thought, right, you know what? It's, it's better. Maybe I'll, I'll take the I'll take the reins at the bar. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, well, in fact, you blame me, but then I would then blame Mark Watt because he uh, he was. I think, I think Angus was involved as well. I think that was the. He was feeding me <laughs> shots of Angostura bitters. So uh... I, I do remember the next day though. You didn't make the full warehouse tasting, but I won't say too much about that. <laughs> I, I was there on time. What do you mean? Oh, no, you were there on time, but you didn't make the end. <laughs> well, I think I'd had a li literally 20 minutes sleep. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yes, it, that yeah, it, it, it was Ang Angus's fault. Yeah. Blame Angus. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's not let's not play the blame game any longer. And, <laughs> I, need to, I need to move on and, and get another bad man. And, um, right. so I'm going to I'm going to take you out the stream. But thanks for that. Okay. The delicious Glen Rothis, and we'll see you back in a bit. Cheers, Eddie. Okay, who have we got now? Uh oh. <laughs> Remember when we 
whiskey was fun. <laughs> Just joking. Cameron, that was great. Thanks, everyone. Hi. Hey, Sam. How are you doing, man? I'm having my Saturday night. Wonderful. Wonderful. With well, Eddie and, and my whiskey family. Absolutely. Well, it's always delightful to see you. Have you like been, have been you comfortable in the director's chair? Have you trimmed your beard? No, I'm not comfortable at all. But can you tell? All day I've been thinking. Yesterday as well, I was thinking. I was like, he's gonna die in that chair. Oh man, I was dead before I got in this chair, to be honest. Um, no, I haven't trimmed my beard. But as you can see, anyone you can hear from my accent, I'm from Aberdeen, Ontario, Canada, and with a beard like this, don't worry, I'm a white male with a beard, so I'm totally qualified to talk about Scotch whiskey. <laughs> yes. We, we know all about that. Well, listen, uh, Sam, so that we can move on and get to the end, I'm going <laughs> to hand over to you because I, I need you to tell us all about darkness. Um, and <laughs> oh, you can read. You might notice people at home, <laughs> that boutique whiskey company, this is not. Yeah. Well, you says, can... I don't know when you're pouring the drams out if you read the label. No, I was reading it. Oh, never mind. It doesn't matter. <laughs> no, it's fine. No, no, no worries. Same company that brings Boutique Whiskey Company, Aerolite, Lindsay, all the rest. Yeah, you're right. All right. I'm happy to speak for a bit about this particular whiskey, which is going to be a real detour from where we've been tonight so far. Those last two whiskeys are right up my street. Absolutely. All right up everyone's street, I would think. But anyway, tell us, tell us about darkness and about this whiskey, Sam. Sure. Well, you say up everyone's street. Let me just stop there. I think that these last two whiskeys show distillery character and that thing that only oxygen can bring uh and uh, cameron mentioned something about the delicacy of it i think are the tunes still on should i kill the tunes it's saturday night let's have a fucking good time um what did he say yeah the oxygen the slow the slow mellowing of whiskey over time and i think in, in a good cast that's exactly what happens darkness is not about that at all darkness is about shoving your face uh with with sherry influence and with um distillery styles and we all the bottlings that we choose for this are uh oddities uh, but let's let's let, let me start at the beginning i think um that's the way the bottle oh god that's the way the bottle used to look you might be familiar with darkness it was sold through master of malt adam brands ben came up with this idea because when we would have uh whiskeys for that boutique whiskey company one way to keep cash flow and also you know like mark was mentioning sometimes you get a cast that's just too big you can't sell 600 bottles of manic more if we take 60 liters out put it into an octave uh, that used to hold pedro jimenez sherry or muscatel or oloroso sherry put in that other cask it will take on a different flavor and then you have also a different product so you have two 12 year old manic mores one in a brandy cask one in an oloroso cask you can sell it as darkness you can sell it as bajiki you can sell it as whatever else you want to call it um so that's that's where the idea came from. When I joined this company, and uh, I'm Sam, in case we haven't introduced myself yet. I'm the white guy with a beard, so I'm credible to be here. If <laughs> I'm obviously being facetious, and if you don't know me, get used to it. It's okay. Um, so when I joined Adam Brands after working whiskey, since I worked in Oddbins in 2002, uh, to working with the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, to working with Sukinder Singh in the Whiskey Exchange, uh, Douglas Lang, uh, and uh, the Balvenny, uh, Will, William Grandsons. I joined Adam Brands two years ago, just over two years ago. And one of the first things I wanted to do was sort of refresh this darkness range as a customer of it for a long time. I used to buy a lot of darknesses. I loved the idea of making something unapologetically strange, you know, um, unapologetically in your face, higher strength, super sherry, not nuanced, not delicate. Um, for that occasion where you want something filthy. And I think I've spoken about this at many of these online tastings we've done in the past uh, and with friends and geeks around the world, um, there is a time and place for that beautiful Glen office we just had with this, or the custard cream Klein leash, that clean distillery style and the beautiful influence of, of uh, American oak usually um, is a gorgeous combination. But sometimes you just want something a bit naughty. You want funk. And nothing, few distilleries, I mean, we can say Campbelltown has a few, is spoiled for them, um, but they're all over Scotland. Some of these, everyone needs a little filth, all you're absolutely right. So let's go to Inchfad then. So 
Darkness, we relaunched uh, really as this eight-year-old. I told you that's how it started when I got here. We redesigned it so you could see the color. Uh, as an eight-year-old, a distillery I can't name, but it is uh, a space-side distillery with partial three times distillation and with worm tubs. Um, finished in Oloroso sherry casks. Uh, that's the core darkness. That's what we'll be repeating. But the one-offs, the things we'll be doing, that's what we're trying tonight. We're trying an inch fad. Now, that's a fucking oddity, isn't it? Inch fad. Some of you might not even know what that is. Inch fad is one of the spirits uh, that is distilled at the Loch Lomond distillery. Now, Loch Lomond is an underrated distillery, but I know we're not supposed to talk about Jim Murray. But some years ago, Jim gave uh, an award to a Japanese whiskey uh, as the whiskey of the year. And it became quite controversial that Japan was doing more innovation than Scotland. And if there was a one word answer to defend that, or I guess it's two words, it's Loch Lomond. Loch Lomond, um, first of all, inherited a tradition from Little Mill Distillery because of the ownership of using a different type of distillation, not strictly pot stills. They had columns sort of on top of the still or a series of plates so you could create really a lot of different styles. So at Loch Lomond, I think they produced, someone's going to correct me, I think they produced nine different makes there currently. Um, I know when I got into whiskey in the 2000s, you could buy Inch Fad, um, but you, you soon after you couldn't. I guess it didn't work out, but you can still buy it as an independent bottler. We see it on the market. They use it for their blends. It's their PD expression, PD heavy uh, expression as well. So it's um, touched less copper as well. Um, so it has... As never mind before we put it in the, the PX cast that you have in your glass now, before that even happens, the, the distillery style already is sort of ripe pear. It's ripe fruits. So it's so close to Rancio, even at a young age. And that's fucking cool because that means you can manipulate the spirit to be able to pull out some of those flavors that you only get with oxygen and time, often at young ages. So like 15, 14, 13 year old inch fads can be really massive uh and so this one's full of cantaloupe when, when we had when we got the sample uh full of cantaloupe really ripe pears like soft pears ones that you just mush into your face you know i don't know how you eat your pear but i take the top off and then eat it from the top holding the bottom but however you eat your pears um inch fad is this particular inch fad has been put in a px cask uh, for six months where it amplified those cantaloupe notes and amplified that sort of rotting fruit flavor, um, bringing out a bit of filth. And then there's a, a layer of smoke because it is, after all, the spirit is, is inch fat. So this, this is really a standout in the whiskeys you have tonight. I'm sorry for taking a detour. We didn't really speak about who was sending what, but uh, I'm still, I, I still think it's a nice break uh, from what we've been having tonight. I hope you enjoy it. And uh, that's the end of that Bahamas song. Slangevin. There was something else I wanted to say, wasn't there? Yeah. <laughs> there he is. Dr. Whiskey of Love. Well, with this kind of lighting, I, Cameron inspired me. When I saw how dark shit was getting, I was like, oh, I got I to gotta light some candles. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it was, it was very romantic, actually, um, if slightly disturbing. Um, Thank you for the um, for the darkness, Inch Fad. Eddie, no, no, um, you're disturbed by this. All he already mentioned right off the top, the compromising positions we've all been with one, with one another. So just leave it. Yeah. I know, I know, I know. I think I'm Don't think disgust. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll sidle into it. Dates. So I see I'm now catching up on some of the notes on the side because I was talking shit for a while. But yes, um, I'm glad you enjoy it. It is... Wet and dank, but sweet and fruity. Yeah, it. Uh, I shouldn't like it, but I do. It's that kind of whiskey, isn't it's it? It's a naughty. Yeah, it is a naughty whiskey. It is filthy. It's. It's. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we already mentioned Jim Murray, but I'm sure people who are really sensitive to sulfur will think that it's off. There's no. We've done a chemical test. There's no sulfur. A very little uh, sulfur detected after the maturation. So, it's um, just toxic. Am I right in saying, Sam, that the the darkness series um, from Atom is 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 your brainchild? Is your is your kind of? No, sorry if I didn't make that clear. When I got here, this already existed. I was a customer. I bought this Linkwood long before I worked at um, Atom. On the back, it says Toby and Ben. 
And now on the back, it says Sam and Toby. So no, I, this is, this was, this already existed. We just sort of tweaked it. And one, one complaint I always had as a, as a whiskey drinker was when they would find a really cool darkness or one that I loved, like a Lefroy, I think that, or a Williamson, I think they called it. It was fucking amazing. Six years old PX cast. It was stunning. I'd go to buy another bottle and it would be gone. So it was unrepeatable. So the first thing I wanted to do was create an eight year old, like a standard meaty style that could stand up to the sherry. So we picked that distillery I already mentioned from Space Side with partial triple distillation and worm tubs that I can't name, put it into sherry cask as an ongoing thing. And then we're doing these one offs. We've, we've just done it for the first time uh, 24 different octaves uh, two weeks ago. I think it came out. Nice, nice. Well, I look forward to trying that. Uh, anything else to look forward to? apart from there's there's a lot of liquid in the pipeline we've been very fortunate that we had a year of a lot of shopping um that had its cost as well obviously but we've um finally seen darkness limited editions of this this is one of those darkness limited edition is the infad um we've done 24 recently where i've got more lined up it takes time we've got to wait six months for for it to phase in, but um, there's plenty more where that came from. We have a whole stream of Isla whiskeys. So the Wind and Wave series from Airlight, Lindsay and Green Isle, that family of whiskeys, we have all those single casts, Wind and Wave. Um, and we've got some more, I, I think yesterday I launched a thing called Bourbon Bourbon or Bourbon Bourbon, like Bourbon Biscuits, mm. but Bourbon Biscuit flavored bourbon. I did that, that yesterday, I think. Count me in. We get up to a lot of stupid shit. I, I won't lie to you, but all tasty. It's all in the pursuit of flavor. Just like I think what Mark said and what I, he said since he's launched his business, I absolutely agree with. Um, I think sometimes in, in the geek world, we we say one thing and do another. We say all that matters is what's inside the glass, and then we only talk about everything else. Well, let's remember all that matters is what's inside the glass. Yeah, here, 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 here. Well, Sam, thanks for that, man, and thank you for the tunes for the uh, musical interlude too. That was uh, that was great. That's my buddy Afi from Toronto, Bahamas. Look him up. He just came up with a new record. It's pretty kick-ass. Nice, nice. Well, maybe we can have a bit more later on when we get back together. Anyway, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna bring on the the MacIver. Uh, let me just see if if I can rouse him. Um, Doug, hello. Good evening, my darling. How are you? I'm all right, honey bun. Yeah, I, uh, I've got to say straight off um, how much I've enjoyed everything that I've tasted uh, so far. Yeah, yeah, absolute stunners, all of them. So well done to you guys. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I think uh, it, it's just testament to the work uh, and the serious attitude of independent bottlers to really go the extra mile and find those special casks. Uh, so okay. fair play to you. And uh, the water's quite nice as well, by the way. <laughs> so, right. Um, okay, so listen, I'm going to let you talk for, uh, for well, for as long as you want, as long as it's no more than 10 minutes. Um, uh, no, I, could, I could do three if you want, but anyway, I, I probably wouldn't be fair. Um, <laughs> um, and, then we'll, and then we'll all get together at the end and have a, have a party. Yeah, it sounds, sounds like a good plan. Um, in case you, you don't know me, uh, many of you won't. Um, my name's uh, Doug or Doogie McIver, uh, Douglas when I'm being naughty, but only my mother calls me Douglas. Um, I've, uh, I've worked for Berry Brothers and Rudd for 19 years now. And uh, the, the tasks that I undertake for them is in um, buying casks, mainly of Scotch whiskey, but also other things such as rum, and, uh, you know, it's had a cognac, armagnac, and bits and pieces. And um, we have a portfolio of um, other spirits, uh, a very well-known number three, uh, London Dry Gin, uh, which is a, a prize-winning gin, which is probably our biggest brand. Um, but Berry Brothers, uh, for most people in the UK, if you say you work with Berry Brothers and Rudd, uh, they, they automatically think fine wine. Um, because that's over the years what we've been best known for. But uh, spirits have actually played a key role in the success of Berry Brothers and Rudd as a company. Um, the firm was uh, founded back in 1698 by a lady called the Widow Bourne. And uh, Berry Brothers was originally um, a business selling coffee, uh, tea and spices and morphed later on into being a, a sort of general uh, provisions company. 
uh, and then started shipping um, not only wine, mainly back in those days it'd be fortified wine, um, but also uh, you know it's some spirits as well. Uh, if we go back to the, the late 1700s, uh, in London, the drink of uh, the gentleman was actually brandy. But throughout the 1800s, a couple of things happened, really, uh, that uh, put a, a little bit of a, a stymie on brandy supplies. The first was the Napoleonic Wars, uh, which finished in 1815. And then, of course, later in the century, uh, phylloxera hit the, the French vine stocks. And uh, that meant that brandy um, was in shorter supply and um, the London merchants looked north of the border and the natural place to go was to find uh, Scotch whisky. Um, back in those days, um, a lot of what was available was quite sort of rough and ready uh, and it wasn't really to the, the palate of uh, the, the London market. So with the advent of blending in the 1850s, it meant that uh, you were able to create something that was uh, softer in style. Um, but as a company, um, I suppose we, we started uh, shipping casks from Scotland and actually bottling in our cellars in St. James's Street in London uh, around about the sort of 1860s, 1870s. Prior to that, um, it had mainly been cognac. But um, with the, the advent, the discovery of uh, these uh, fantastic whiskies from up north, and if they were uh, matured in the right way, uh, they were a, a very adequate and sometimes a better option than what we'd been shipping from France in the past. Um, so we, we have records, uh, price lists, that go back to late Victorian times of um, some of the casts that we were selling. Uh, to our customers from the sellers at number three St. James's Street, uh, things like uh, 1885 Macallans and Talisker's and Highland Parks and all sorts of, uh, you know, sort of really sort of top notch malts. But malt whiskey didn't really uh, come into its own until about sort of 35 years ago, I suppose. You know, I've been working for Berry Brothers for 19 years now and I, I'm one of the new boys. Um, I've got quite a few colleagues uh, that work in the company who have been there for sort of uh, more than 30 years. And I'm, I'm sort of lucky in the sense that I work with uh, two other uh, undisputed whiskey anoraks. Uh, one of them's name has cropped up already during our conversations um, with other guests this evening, uh, Ronnie Cox, who was the, the global brand ambassador or brand's heritage ambassador for uh, the Glen Rothes single malt for many years. And uh, the connection there is that uh, Berry Brothers actually um, owned the Glen Rothes uh, trademark for a number of years. And um, Ronnie's job was to go around the world extolling the virtues. We then sold that. And the reason that we had a connection with Glen Rothes was that going back to the 1920s, 1923, Berry Brothers and Rudd um, created. Um, a, a soft style blended whiskey that was very approachable to um, the London markets, uh, the London taste, that it was designed to be a whiskey that was uh, easy to have as perhaps a, an aperitif style uh, or maybe, you know, something that was sort of softer to the London palate at the time. That was Cutty Sark, which um, we, we owned for many years and uh, at one point was the, the biggest selling blended whiskey in the United States. So whiskey has played a, a key part in the success of Berry Brothers over the years. It's a family company. Uh, since I joined, um, we sold Cutty Sark and then uh, we sold the Glen Rothes trademark um, back to the Edrington Group um, who owned the distillery. Uh, and uh, since then, we've concentrated much more on what were our origins really, which was as uh, independent bottlers, whether it was with cognac or, or whiskey. So um, I'm in the market every day looking for casks like uh, the rest of the guys that you've been listening to uh, during the, the program this evening. Um, and I have to say that I think everyone's mentioned uh, how friendly an industry this is. And we, we all rely on the big distillers, of course, but 
Uh, we rely on each other because, you know, sometimes we can do a little trades together. If I've got sort of five too many of something and somebody wants a little bit of something that I've got and vice versa, um, we we sort of keep uh, friendships and, uh, you know, the, the commercial side of the business going as well. You know, so it's not just about friendship. There, there is commerce. There are ways that we can support each other and other things that we, we do. Um, so I suppose everyone's sort of uh, revealed their philosophies uh, of uh, how they approach, you know, their selection, et cetera. And at Berry Brothers, whether it's wine buyers or myself as a whiskey buyer, sorry, I, I forgot to mention the other um, person um, before I move on to the, our philosophy. And uh, there's three three uh, whiskey anoraks in the company, myself included, Ronnie I've mentioned, and the other one's Johnny McMillan, uh, who some of you may know, uh, who's based up in Edinburgh. And uh, I think uh, if the prize for the biggest anorak of the three of us, we call ourselves the, the, the three dram eagles. Um, if the uh, prize went for the biggest anorak, then it's, it's probably got to be Johnny. But um, anyway, going back to the philosophy, um, really, really simple. Um, we only bottle what we like drinking ourselves. But there's a sort of four main criteria that I look for uh, when I'm selecting whiskies. Uh, it's balance, complexity, and uh, texture, which is really important. And the third thing, we don't really talk about age, we talk about maturity of spirit, because I've bottled some whiskies that were, you know, sort of four years old, that were already mature and wonderful. So don't let um, age be uh, something that puts you off because some of these younger whiskies can be fantastic. And equally, at the other end of the scale, um, you will get something uh, different from a whiskey that spent a, a long time in the wood. Uh, and sometimes that's something that you just can't get from younger whiskies. And what we're tasting now, um, this is Tomor, which is a, a distillery in Speyside. Uh, this is a 26-year-old. It was distilled in 1992. This one's bottled, uh, forgive me, 45.2%, which is the natural strength, but it's come down to that strength naturally over the years sitting in the cask. And we probably wouldn't have left it for far too much longer um, because we thought this had just got to a nice balance. Um, there wasn't too much uh, over-extraction from the wood, although there are some oak tannin notes starting to come through, which you'll find in older whiskies, and it's not a bad thing as long as they're still in balance. So as we uh, look at this one, on the nose, um, one of the first things that sort of jumped out at me was um, there's an element of uh, sort of linseed oil, but that subsides a little bit, and then you start to get a lot of the uh, uh, sort of tropical fruit notes, you get um, something like a sort of quince jam, ripe tropical fruits, and uh, even perhaps some hints of pineapple coming in there. And uh, I have to say, this is what I get. You know, I, I don't expect you to get this because everybody's different. And uh, I try not to sort of ram tasting notes. And uh, as uh, somebody mentioned, the power of Jedi, um, you know, uh, suggestion is not always a good thing. I rather, I'd rather that people sort of found out a um, what they got from the whiskey, and and b ultimately whether you actually like it or not. You know, but uh, on the palate, this is uh, this is quite a sort of long lingering, chewy style of whiskey. It's delicious. It's delicious. Slight licorice notes coming through on the on the palate there, and there's a there's a little edge of something akin to uh, Sauvignon Blanc coming through. Um, I don't want to say the word um, cat's pee, uh, which was an allusion to uh, a novel written by Scott um, Fitzgerald. Was that his name? Uh, the Great Cat's Pee. But um, anyway, it, it's quite fitting that uh, a whiskey coming from uh, a well-known wine merchant has a little bit of Sauvignon Blanc uh, characteristic coming through it. But an older whiskey, and yes, obviously, uh, because it's an older whiskey, 
it would be more expensive than a lot of the whiskies that you've tried to date. Um, sadly, uh, the whiskey market is, uh, even though there, there's more stock becoming available in the market at the moment, uh, that the price of um, more aged casks is, uh, you know, still extremely high. Um, but we still think this is very uh, a good value dram, uh, considering the age and uh, the, the the quality of the spirit. So I, I hope you enjoyed that. Now, um, Eddie, if you like, you can uh, abuse me for a few minutes uh, before we return to the green room or uh, open up to <laughs> questions, etc. Did I catch you off guard, darling? No, not at all. But there's a little bit of um, feedback. I don't know what it is. Oh, it seems to have disappeared now. Um, that's a that's I mean that, well they've all been fabulous drams um, and I'm I'm so pleased that they've they've all come together so beautifully um, all topped off by the by the Tormor, which is still so fresh isn't it I mean for a 26 year old whiskey it's obviously not been in too vociferous a cask so it's just it's just slowly 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 got to its uh, kind of uh, tip-off point, if you like, hasn't it? Yeah, I think it was a nice progression through the the different whiskies um, tonight. I have to say that um, I'm a, a huge fan of Clang Leash, uh, and I'm, uh, I've saved some of that for, for later on, um, <laughs> you know, just to have with my big, fat uh, Cuban cigar. <laughs> yeah. the, the one um, pretending to be a silk cut. Or well, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a rectangular cigar. <laughs> <laughs> um, good. Okay. Well, listen. Let's um, let's get everyone else back in because I'd like to get everyone in on this. And... Is that right? 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 I more light though. I so think you, everything about that's wrong, Sam. <laughs> you think it's like that's not like how he is in reality, but actually, every time I meet Sam, that's what he's like. You know, he's <laughs> walking to a bar and he's sitting there going like this. I, th I think I think he's got worse. What rocking? <laughs> <laughs> All right, sorry, sorry, we're back on. We're back on. We're back on. We're back on. Well, listen, guys and gals, thank you so much. That was great fun. Um, but let's uh, let's let's have a little chat amongst ourselves. Does anyone um, want to um, start with their favourite of this evening that wasn't theirs? Well, I, I, I've already said, you know, um, I, I'm a big fan of Van Leech. So it's not true. Turn the music down a little. Yeah. You don't have to yell, Dad. <laughs> Your tea is ready. Uh, yes, you've guessed right, it's Ollie's. <laughs> No, it, it was um, the Marek Moore. I thought was the the most was the most surprising one actually of the night. Uh, well, but I guys, I've had that. I've had that. I've had a lot of that Manic Moore now, and uh, yeah, I can keep on drinking. I'm yeah. very yeah. happy. Yes, I think. It's, uh, uh, yeah, the the Glen I mean, Rothers as well is sublime. You know, the the, the Klein Leash is the 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 easy one to say that is your favourite because, like, if you don't like Klein Leash, you should probably give up drinking. Um, yeah, and, well, and the darkness is my friend. Um, it's this, this, everything was good. I, I, I would, I'm pretty sure the rest of the panel would say I'd quite happily bottle any of those, and I, I can't think anyone would. Okay, I did bottle two of them, but that's two of them. But, but, um, in fairness, yeah. Mark. I tried to do one that I'd done, but because I've sold out, so I have to go back to one of yours. Yeah, you had to go back to the site <laughs> that I didn't sell, eh? <laughs> <laughs> it was all good. But no, um, I, th I think they're all, they're all excellent and bring their own individual character, which is, which I think is something that Ollie speaks about a lot. Um, and I, I think it's important. Yeah. yeah. Jess, I didn't see which one it was you held up. I couldn't see. I still can't see it. 
Oh, you're on mute, Santa Claus. Santa Claus. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have to see. Team Mark finishes are okay. The, yeah. the one I didn't want to like was was the inch fad. I didn't want to Sam, but it's a yeah. bit like SMN. I don't want to like it. But I kind of do. You know, every you know, you just every now and again a bit of leather. It's just, it's just oh, really yeah. I, I have I have seen your search terms. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know what made me laugh is I was thinking about it, and I, and I was back with Dougie going like four or five year old lead check proper oily filth and thinking that's it's just the right thing to do every now and again you need that yeah well, someone, you need that filthy young drown are, are we in, are we live ad or just live between us <laughs> we publicly live or just live we're, we're, we're still publicly live because i thought okay. that, right okay I thought that, to see how, <laughs> why how, what have we done wrong cameron <laughs> oh, no, no 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 i was going to say something else there then i realized i better check that first oh now you've got to say it <laughs> Wind the bobbin no, 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 up. I can't. <laughs> as long as, as long as it's nothing derogatory about Mark, <laughs> I can't promise that one. No, no. <laughs> He's not allowed to say that by law. It's, 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 it's not. It's not. It's actually about me, but it's it's, it's really bad. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, you've got to say it. No. I'm kidding. No. No. Dougie, it'll be pleasures. It's pleasures. Dougie, did you say the Klein Leash was your favourite, Dougie? Yeah, yeah. But I'm I'm very biased because uh, Klein Leash and Kalila are my two sort of favourite malts. And the only reason I can say that is because uh, I've been in the trade for 30 years. And over the years, they're just, uh, for me, the, the most consistent two um malts that I just keep going back to all the time and you rarely get a bad one. Careful. I think I think with Kalila, it doesn't matter how many times they knock the distillery down and rebuild it, they still make it good. It, like it's consistently good. And I think that's you know, people speak about craft oh small, it's great. Look, it's craft distilled. Yeah, it's made by someone who doesn't know anything. Um, but you know not all the time. I just like hanging people off here. But like, what I mean is, just because something's big, like Kalila is owned by the dark side, you know, Diageo, etc. Got to love them. But just because it's made by big people doesn't mean it's bad, you know. And I think Kalila is the proper anti-craft movement whiskey, if that makes sense. Like, can I just? Every, say, you know, that you're really tall. Are you yeah. saying that because you're really tall and you're like <laughs> big people can make good whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is that um, the the redeveloped Kalila Distillery from the late sixties, yeah, when they built uh, Klein Leash, they're built on the same blueprint. Even though they're entirely different tasting whiskies, the distilleries are built on the same blueprint. So I yeah. don't know if that's got something. The same with yeah. so, It's also the, even even like the the name they've got now is actually like from not maybe not. Of ourselves here, but like, um, all the same thing, all the independent bottlers, though, like, um, you know, like Kalila, like, like, some Mortley, Klein Leash. A lot of the sort of big names have came from the, the hype that's been brought up from independent bottlings because people have tried their whiskey when they couldn't have done it before, and therefore they've managed to try whiskey that they would have normally tried before. Then they've went, well, This is pretty good. So, obviously, the owners have went, Well, let's try and like. like in the sixties, like Arbeg, for instance, you know, like, it was independent bottlers that, that sort of pushed the bottle for that. They pushed the boat for that, you know. Um, Arbeg was getting like pushed to to everyone, and nobody would buy it. Yeah, I mean, if oh, if, if you were to buy you were to buy a cask of heavily sherry space side whiskey, they'd say, "Oh, well, you take a couple of casks of that seventy four Arbeg that no one wants." Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, and in years to come, we'll be saying the same thing. But oh God, why didn't I buy? And I'm yeah. not going to mention names, but you know, why didn't we buy that that everyone wants? Yeah, yeah. Well, I I still remember getting told by um, Andrew Simonton. I was asking him about you know deals you did that you're really happy with, deals you did that you didn't weren't happy with. I guess years ago in the in the early '90s, I was sitting in a pub and I overheard a conversation with a guy going, "I've got this." Fucking poor Ellen, and I can't sell it. It's awful. <laughs> and he went, I'll take it. And it was all of those um, 
the otter. You remember the otter on the label? Yeah. And for years, he had loads of cars. To, like, can you imagine someone rocked up in a pub today and went, you know, I've got all this poor talent. I can't sell it. Uh, yeah, but then how do you how do you get people to like your whiskey? Close your distillery. It's true. He did also say that he <laughs> to sell it in the 1990s. So, you know. I, I mean, I don't have much stock, so there's no point in firebombing any distilleries anymore. But the rest <laughs> might have stock that are worthwhile. Yeah. If, if anything burns down in Campbelltown, Mark, we'll know who it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I was thinking, because Springbank's a little bit too close to my own house. <laughs> it's quite a long road, though, isn't it? You know. <laughs> I did love what Cameron said earlier about us actually being dependent bottlers, that idea that we are so dependent and we didn't say it once tonight. And I, I don't know if anyone attended the virtual whiskey festival last week uh, and the weekend before, um, but sometimes independent bottles do need to sort of defend or, or build our own credibility. We didn't do that at all tonight. I think that's really great. We don't need to defend ourselves. Blenders don't need to defend themselves. There are different drinkers for different occasions. We're dependent on the big companies. Um, what do we have tonight? Manic Moore, we mentioned Mortlock, Glen Elgin, yep. Klein Leach. Yeah. These are produced by the big bad guy, but actually we, we, we depend on that to happen. It doesn't mean that our, our independent bottled whiskeys are independently bottled whiskeys are better or worse. Um, we have a we have an audience, a fixed audience of geeks who will want to try that strange thing, but 60 million other right. people are drinking their, everything else. It works both ways though, you know, because yeah. to the same degree, yeah. we're, the, we're the bad guys when when a distiller wants to talk about their brand and their heritage and their consistency, uh, we're the good guys when nobody's buying their brand and their heritage and their consistency. Because it's probably well, well, that's why I kind of brought up earlier. We're just a little more kind of thing. Between distillers and independent bottlers, we love them and they hate us. <laughs> that's not necessarily true. You know. Yeah, but I don't think so either. There is. I, I, I mean, mean, I think... Uh, I think you just go through periods, as, as you said. You do. You go through periods where they, where we're really important, where we're not. Our job is just to find good whiskey. It kind of really doesn't doesn't yeah. matter where it comes from or when it comes from, as long as it tastes good. The only thing I think that's a bit frustrating as a as an independent bottler is we're forever celebrating, or I feel we're forever celebrating change in an industry. We're we're celebrating development. And you know, some some people in this room have seen a bit more development and change than, than the rest of us, um, and can probably talk about that probably more precisely than I can. But you, when you go to the big distillers, the marketing companies specifically, and the big distillery companies, they never want to talk about change or development. They want to talk about now, and I think in a way that's really sad. Because Scotch whiskey is all about change. It's all about spirit developing over not in cars, but with distilleries, yeah. etc. And I'm, I'm I'm the same as you, Ollie, because I came from a, a sort of retail um, background, you know, going back to my days in Milroy's. And uh, you know, the, the 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 bigger companies were like, hugely supportive of us because we were hugely supportive of stocking their brands and you know selling lots of um, their product. Um, and then sometimes, you know, because we ran a, a sort of small independent bottling business on the side of that back in the day um you know they were very supportive to us as well you know um so i think uh the, the industry as a whole we all need each other i think that's yeah, um yeah. that's yeah. the message totally agree. i think one of the things i love most about the whiskey industry is it's a global industry but it's tiny we all know each other you know and we've all alluded to the things we've done with each other and that sounded <laughs> Much worse than that, I mean, but you know, we, we've ended up in compromise. Well, at least you said with and not until you, Mark. I mean, <laughs> I, I was thinking, well, well, well. <laughs> but what I, what I mean is, like, it's a global industry that goes around the world, but there's a group of it, particularly in independent bottlers, we all know each other, stick together, and you know, we'll phone each other up in the middle of the night or whatever, and it's you know, it's quite normal, and I don't think there's other industries that necessarily do that. Or I didn't tell him that it wasn't the middle of the night. Or am I going to tell him it wasn't the middle of the night? 
It's normally yeah. around about midnight, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the phone calls go. <laughs> I just, I just, whenever I'm talking to Mark, I just want the, to be the last thing I do before I, I have nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, listen, guys, we could go on all night, and we possibly will, um, but we're going to draw a close to the broadcast element of this. Um, so I just want to thank all of you for giving up your time this evening and for your wisdom. Uh, thank you to all the lovely customers for tuning in, and we'll hopefully see you tomorrow bright and breezy. And, yeah, take care of yourselves, and be nice. Uh, thanks a lot, Eddie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda. Yeah.